I'm going to be telling you uh, a whole bunch of things about U.S. intelligence that you've not heard before, so let me get rid of two preliminaries. One is, ah, well, um, uh, the, uh, only the failures of U.S. intelligence uh, are public. Uh, there must be all sorts of secret successes that have not been made public. Not so. Uh, it just isn't so, believe me. If there were successes, they would trumpet them from, from, from the highest podium. Um, and second, um, who the hell am I? Why should you be listening to me? So let me very briefly point out uh, what my role in U.S. intelligence was and why I can speak to you the way that I do. Uh, U.S. intelligence is a huge apparatus. You've Nobody really knows how many people are employed by it. Uh, if you look at the Washington Post's uh, series on, on the subject, published last year, uh, I think an eight-part series, uh, you will see a, um, a community quite literally without bounds. $70 billion is a rough estimate of what the uh, uh, of the size of the community that community is split into many many pieces all of which are necessarily compartmented so you can have so virtually everybody who works in it and has ever worked in it has worked within a compartment which is sealed off from others for reasonable security reasons. Now, this means that virtually everybody who has ever worked in it knows very, very little except the little thing that he's, that he's working on. Furthermore, the, the fields that, that intelligence covers are, quite, are so wide. Human, uh, human intelligence, of course, the various kinds of technical intelligence uh, the, uh, there, is, there is no end to the specialized expertise. And again, very few people have the capacity, never mind the authorization, to look into these things. Now, there are a few people who do, who have the authorization and the capacity. Uh, uh, and they are, oh, maybe what? 40 people or so at the, in the, on the DCI's immediate staff, uh, the so-called intelligence community staff, uh, and about a dozen people in the Congress. Uh, their job is primarily to fit the pieces together, primarily from a budgetary standpoint. My job uh, in the Congress was precisely that. I w my job was the, I was the charge of the, of the chairman of the uh, budget subcommittee, and so therefore a stack of stuff, stack of budget proposals that thick had to go through me every, every year. Now, what made a, the difference between myself and most of these 40 or people on the executive side and and a dozen or so on the congressional side is that uh, I'm a college professor and I took my job as a, as a warrant for uh, trying to understand what the hell is going on. Uh, my work can be read in unclassified form in my book, Informing Statecraft, 1992, uh, in the series Intelligence Requirements for the 1980s, edited by Roy Godson, uh, and in books, it, in works that you, you will see in, uh, when you look me up in Google. Uh, the point is that you will find very few other people who have ever looked 
at the entire thing with the purpose of trying to understand it. Now, that out of the way, uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to tell you is basically two things. One, that uh, U.S. intelligence suffers from a variety of technical problems, grave technical problems, namely uh, approaches to the job that are inherently dysfunctional, that will not, that will, are guaranteed to produce bad results. Uh, but secondarily, and more importantly, that even if those technical problems were fixed, it, uh, U.S. intelligence would still be dysfunctional because of the way that the, our governing class uh, takes intelligence and international relations in general. So I will spend uh, perhaps 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, talking about the technical factors uh, from which you may actually learn some facts you didn't know. And then I will talk about how uh, the, the really more important human approaches to intelligence. First, everything stems, all the problems ultimately stem from a misunderstanding, unwillingness to face the meaning of the word intelligence, which is quite simply information that is useful for a purpose. Now, that information need not be from any extraordinary source, but it must be relevant to a purpose. It must make a difference between what it is you're going to do with it or not do without it. Let me give you an example. 1962, uh, Cubans are pouring out of the island fleeing Fidel Castro, bringing with them all sorts of stories, including lots and lots of stories about missiles being emplaced on the island. Uh, and, I mean, these, these, you know, these stories are published all over the press. Uh, the U.S. government is under pressure to do something. And uh, about midsummer, the uh, U.S. government does send high-level reconnaissance flights over Cuba, and sure enough, uh, these high-level reconnaissance flights show uh, uh, that um, things are being built in Cuba that look exactly like SS-5 bases, the SS-5 missile bases that are already existed in Poland, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, etc., aimed at Europe. Uh, missiles. Ah, uh, well, what was the Kennedy administration going to do about it? Well, the Kennedy administration decided, as is typical of, of, uh, of bad policymakers, to want to look for more intelligence. Why more intelligence? Why more information? What, was, what difference was more information going to make? Well, the Kennedys hoped against hope that these missiles being in place in Cuba were air defense missiles, even though they looked like hell, like SS-5s. But at any rate, uh, Kennedy ordered a um, low-level mission uh, to get close-ups. Mission accomplished, lost one pilot, got lots of close-ups, and by golly, there they were, the SS-5s, just like you would have, you would have imagined. Uh, point is that he didn't learn any more about those missiles by looking at the close-ups than you would have learned about females by looking at a, at a Playboy centerfold. You know, I mean, the close-up just doesn't, you know, female's a female, an SS-5 is an SS-5. Um, what, was it, what, was it, what did he do with, what did he do with these close-ups? Well, he thought it was necessary to present to allies. Uh, these pictures were sent to uh, the hands of Charles Boland to Charles de Gaulle. 
Poland made the case that this was a terribly serious matter for America. America was ready to go to war, and here was the proof. And he slid this folder across to de Gaulle. De Gaulle never took his eyes off of Boland, put his hand on the folder, pushed it back, and said, uh, it is enough for me to know that your country is ready to go to war on this matter. Tell your president that France is with you in war and in peace. Stood up, walked out. Now, that man knew what was important. Here was a, here was a, a crucial issue. A decision had been made that, that might, have, might involve war. Which side was France going to be on? Real simple, as far as he was concerned. Parenthesis. Turned out that de Gaulle was wrong, that, uh, and that by the time Boland was speaking, Robert Kennedy had already contacted uh, Dobrynin and preemptively surrendered the U.S. missiles in Europe in exchange for the removal of it. But that's another story. The point is that uh, John Kennedy somehow thought that more information would help him make a better decision. That was not the case. The elements, the, the elements of the decision were there. He just screwed up the decision. But that's another story. That's another story. Okay. So much for the essence of of, uh, of intelligence. The from that it follows that uh, any search for facts should, in fact, be tailored to answering a question ab about what it is that we are going to do and what it is that we are not going to do. That is not the way, however, U.S. intelligence is structured. U.S. intelligence is structured as a producer-dominated system. In other words, there's a structure out there that does what it does, it produces what it produces, and you as the consumer, take it and like it or lump it. That's what you get. What is, it that, what is this, this structure? Let me just start briefly with, with the, the human side. 98%, it's actually a little more than that, but 98% of um, U.S case officers, CIA human collectors, are under so-called official cover. That is to say, they, they pretend to be what I was, <laughs> a Foreign Service officer. And as such, they have the, all of the access and all of the limitations that Foreign Service officers, Foreign Service officers, agricultural attaches, and other U.S. employees have abroad. Uh, not surprisingly, the quality of CIA re human reporting is not significantly different, although, and, and insofar as it is different, it is worse than that of the Foreign Service. By the way, one reason for that is that in the Foreign Service used to be strictly on the basis of merit, uh, strictly on the basis of exams. CIA is something else. Employment in the CIA is, is a matter of, uh, of co-option, not merit exams. But that's another story. But the, the point is that the cover is that these people are not really undercover, uh, not under, undercover at all. And in fact, most people, most so-called agents who come to our collectors, who are our case officers, are walk-ins. Uh, the greatest successes in U.S. intelligence in World War II achieved by, uh, by uh, Alan Dulles were achieved by Alan Dulles quite literally hanging out his shingle on the Herengasse in, uh, in Bern. Uh, and 
putting out an ad in the newspaper saying that I have arrived and I'm ready to receive uh, any Nazi who is willing to talk. Uh, now, uh, when that happens, and you know the other side feels like it's losing, you're going to get a whole bunch of people who are who are perfectly willing to turn traitor. Uh, but when the other side doesn't think it's losing, why well, you're likely to get a whole bunch of people who are, well, to say the least, problematic. Uh, and the problem, and I'll get to that in, uh, in uh, greater length in about two minutes, is that given the dearth of information that, that uh, we have, um, that CIA gets, it tends to take what it gets and call it good. This is a, this is a very, very, very serious problem. Uh, you don't have, as a clandestine intelligence, uh, you have um, a pretense thereof. I mean, there's a, one of the old jokes at CIA is uh, about the, the man who was trained uh, to infiltrate the Ukraine, and he was taught the uh, history of a particular village where he was supposed to have been born, spoke the dialect perfectly, uh, the, imitated the walk and the talk and the mannerisms. Finally, he was infiltrated into the Ukraine, walks into a bar, and the, uh, the bartender says, ah, you're the American spy. Uh, which the man curses in the right way, names the saints of the village, et cetera, et cetera. And the bartender keeps on saying, ah, but no, you're the American spy. So this goes on for a while. And after a while, the, the American says, okay, 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 I give up. I'm the American spy. How did you know? He says, because you're black. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. Um, we do not take... Chinese Americans and send them to China where they can pass for Chinese. As a matter of fact, of the 2% or actually now less than 2% of people under non-official cover, I know of only, knew of only five people who carried double documentation, who actually occasionally passed themselves off as something other than Americans. Now, and these people are not used for recruiting. They're considered so valuable, they're used only for agent handling, for clandestine communication. So, uh, it is uh, not at all, uh, uh, it's actually perfectly normal for decision makers to look at CIA reporting, uh, human reporting, and uh, find there nothing terribly remarkable. I'll get to a, a remarkable situation in just um, just a moment. Let me turn very briefly to the technical side, where you will see similar a similar problem. Uh, the um, the, the um, imaging systems that were created in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, served a useful purpose in providing a, a little bit of information about the Soviet Union, about which we knew virtually nothing. We didn't know how big cities were, how big where um, production facilities were. If we had gone to war with the Soviet Union, we really didn't know what, where the hell we might strike, what good it might do. And so a, a basic mapping of the Soviet Union was achieved by high-level reconnaissance and by the earlier satellites. But at a certain point, the, the question of, uh, of, of policy, what should we do, entered in, and 
the attempt to answer those questions with technical means turned out to be um, quite self-delusive. You walk into, into uh, the, the, um, uh, the lobby, of the inner lobby of CIA, and you still see uh, on the, uh, uh, what do you call on the walls, uh, as, as um, wallpaper, close-ups of downtown Moscow. The subliminal message is, ah, we know what's going on there. No, you don't. <laughs> you have no idea who is in there, what they're thinking, what they're after, or anything like that. Uh, and also, you, all, you, you must realize, in just as in the case of the human collectors, that the other side knows what it is you are looking at. Satellites, of course, are easily visible by radar and, and are in most cases and now in all cases, their functions are very well known. Uh, so, uh, so what is it that, uh, that you are seeing? You are seeing, something, you are seeing things that, uh, that they want you to see and not seeing things that you don't. Let me give you an example of what, of what you can see if they know you're not looking. In 1976, we launched the KH-11 uh, for the first time. And for the first few passes, uh, of course, nobody knew what it was. Uh, this, the KH-11, of course, is this uh, real-time uh, digital imaging satellite. It is, by the way, the very first digital camera. It was developed by U.S. intelligence at a cost of a little over a billion dollars. The, so the first digital camera cost about a, about a billion bucks. Anyway, first pass, uh, just, we're just taking pictures just to, just to see what, you know, see what's... One picture of the, from the middle of Siberia, middle of nowhere, showed a, an uh, SS-11 missile together with a whole bunch of supporting craft, support of trucks, etc., uh, with a transporter erector launcher. We had never seen an SS-11 like that. We had never seen a, a Soviet ICBM in a mobile launch mode. That was the first time we'd seen it and the last time we ever saw it. Why? Well, because, you see, this thing is, the, the, the KH-11 quickly became known. The satellite warning program was, it was put in the satellite warning program and there you go. So you have, you have this inherent limitation in, uh, in, our, uh, in our collection. Let me now turn to the, um, to what I think in, in terms of, of intelligence operations is the most important issue, and that is counterintelligence. Counterintelligence is a fancy word for quality control, for skepticism about what it is you are doing, and consciousness that the other side will know what you're doing. Uh, the ultimate in the ultimate counterintelligence coup, of course, is to get your people in a position to vet the other side's agents. This is what happened to the United States when a man by the name of Aldrich Ames turned traitor. Now that was, this was a, I'm mentioning this not simply to point out that, you know, what a bad thing that was, uh, because uh, for good or ill, traitors will always be with us. And this was, as I say, an unusually terrible uh, event. But just to give you an idea of what, of what this, these things mean, of what counterintelligence means. Aldrich James was 
in charge of counterintelligence for the Soviet East European Division of CIA. As such, he vetted all agents from that side coming to us and everyone we sent in the other direction. Now, he did so because he was working for the KGB, strictly at the direction of the KGB, which meant that our entire, read entire network was in, was in the hands of the KGB. And for about eight years, eight crucial years, all the reporting that was coming from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe via CIA channels to the United States was written by the KGB. Now, I'll tell you what this meant. These were, the, these were the Gorbachev years. These were the years in which the Soviet Union was teetering. During this time, the New York Times ran outstanding uh, articles, pages, well, they, they had a dedicated section every day for, what, six years, edited by Bill Keller, who is now the managing editor. He's a lousy managing editor. He was a stellar reporter. Uh, our Forest Service reporters agreed 100% with the New York Times uh, assessment of what was going on, namely that Gorbachev was an incompetent communist who was who despite his best efforts to keep the system together was wrecking it. At the same time, the stuff that was coming in from CIA was saying, no, no, Gorbachev is a canny reformer who is doing the, the, the West's work and he deserves uh, the West's support. The result was a... Uh, uh, most of you were not, uh, were not uh, conscious in 1991. But on, this, on, on August 1st, 1991, President George H.W. Bush stood in front of a million Ukrainians in Kiev and told them that the Soviet Union had a bright future under Gorbachev, and that they should be good little Soviet citizens. The speech, by the way, was written by Condoleezza Rice. Uh, no more need be said. The point is that it, was, that it made sense only in terms of the stuff that was coming in from CIA, because everything else that was coming in from the newspapers, from the Foreign Service, uh, was saying exactly the opposite. Now, let me, let me now tell you something which I found, which I learned only recent, well, only a few years ago, and found shocking. I would not have believed it. I and people like myself had always asked, now, when you have a conflict between intelligence reporting on the one side and what ordinary intelligence, intelligence with a lowercase i, is telling you. Now, does not common sense force you to, to ask questions? What's going on here? Uh, why should we not listen to intelligence with a lowercase i? You know, shouldn't we do that? And I, my uh, proclivity had always been to say, ah, these CIA people are stupid. Well, uh, that was too easy uh, a judgment on my part, and wrong. In, 1990, in 2005, uh, Tim Weiner of the New York Times published a book called Legacy of Ashes. I don't know if anybody has seen that book. You ought to take a look at it. Uh, in it, he interviews Fred Hitz. Fred was the general counsel of CIA, a man with whom I've had I've crossed swords many times, a dogged defender of CIA. But Fred uh, was, was asked to do damage assessment on, on the Ames case. And, you know, he did the usual 
the Amit assessment. But then at the end, he asked the question that I've been asking. Didn't anybody notice the difference between the uh, CIA reporting and, and reality? Didn't anybody notice? And the answer was, yes, they did notice. And to Fred's shocking, shocked, amazement, the folks at the, um, at the head of uh, the report section of the DDO admitted that they suspected, strongly suspected, the truth. Namely, that our, our network was in the hands of the KGB. Nevertheless, they passed on these reports because, quote, we believed that these were things the president needed to hear, unquote. I mean, poor, poor Fred uh, <laughs> was devastated. He said, but, but, but we're not here to do that. We're supposed to be here to, you know, to tell the truth. Uh, what, what? But the fact is, and this will bring me to my next point, that the desire for an outcome, the desire to shape U.S. policy has, is now so strong within U.S. intelligence that it overcomes all sorts of things. There's a feeling in the intelligence community that we know better. We have the right to steer U.S. policy. Uh, if you have any doubt, you were, um, I know you were all sentient by the, uh, by the, se the um, second half of the George W. Bush administration. And if you, you, you could easily follow in the newspapers the war that took place between the CIA and the Bush administration. I mean, every time that the Bush administration had a, uh, had a uh, decision to make, the CIA would come out with either an official document or with, an ofi or with a strongly officious leak uh, undermining the Bush administration's positions. Uh, perhaps the clearest example of what I'm talking about is the Iran um, nuclear assessment of 2007. This happened right after CIA had convinced George W. Bush to fire uh, uh, Porter Goss, the, the um, director whom he had appointed precisely to stop this war, but that's another story. This meant that one faction of CIA was able to clean out of the bureaucracy its enemies and wrote the, a new estimate on the Iranian nuclear program that was obviously, very, very obviously, I mean, any, anyone, any, any of you can read it and will, are sure to draw the same conclusion as a, uh, hey, now we've got the position and now we can deny every every um, premise that the, the, the previous drafters uh, had made in their draft. Uh, this is our position. Now, the intellectual basis for that, of course, were, were obviously ridiculous, including removing from the criteria of um, important, of things important to nuclear development, the most important thing of all, namely the enrichment of uranium. Uh, you know, if, you, if, you don't, if you've got enriched uranium, you can have a nuclear weapon. If you haven't got it, you don't. And Iran, of course, uh, has never stopped shouting to the heavens that it is enriching uranium as fast as it knows how. But at any rate, the point is that uh, this is not at all unusual that uh, the um, struggles 
within the production and analysis part of U.S. intelligence are about policy, not truth. Uh, I see how much time I've got. Uh, not much. Uh, let me give you just a, a worm's eye view. Uh, I was 27 years old. I'd just gotten into the Foreign Service. And my first job was as the I Iberian Peninsula desk officer. I was in charge of the um, Bureau of Intelligence and Research section on the Iberian Peninsula. First day on the job, I was asked to do a little paper. Uh, very simple thing on what, a, what the Communist Party had done at its Congress regarding something. So my office was full of these wonderful Spanish and Portuguese newspapers. So I just dove into them and in a few minutes uh, whipped up a paper, walked, uh, had my, my secretary type it up. In those days, people like myself had secretaries. <laughs> and I walked into my boss's office. Here's the paper. Boss read the paper, said, this is brilliant. This is great. Thank you so much. And uh, with the congratulations ringing in my ears, I started walking out. The boss said, no, wait a minute. <coughs> oh? He says, now we've got to coordinate it. Coordinate it, you say? <laughs> yes, coordinate it. We're sending it off to, to the embassy, to CIA and uh, DIA, and to the desk office. Uh, and um, then we'll get back their comments and uh, we'll revise and we'll incorporate them. To make a long story short, it took me a week to go through this process. And what had been a straightforward little reporting job on a, you know, uh, on a nothing question turned into this, this worthless exercise uh, adjusting all of the interests in U.S. policy. My buddy, uh, Dick Pipes, who was, who was asked to come to, by, the, by President Ford to, um, uh, to come and arbitrate a, a serious uh, difference uh, between CIA and, and, and DIA on, uh, on Soviet armaments, at a certain point said to me, why, why? These people don't care about, at all about the Soviet Union. It might as well be on the planet Pluto for them. All they care about is each other. He's right. He was quite right. Uh, this is basically uh, the, the, the state of analysis. Now, uh, let me now conclude very briefly with what should have been really my main point, which is the things are, these things are the way they are because the people at the top, presidents, secretaries of state and defense, really don't want it to be anything else and, can, and would probably not abide anything else. Because they want intelligence, quite literally, to cover their rear. Uh, so they can say, as... George, H. George Bush did as, I just did what intelligence said. Hey, who am I? Yeah. Don't hold me responsible. Don't hold my judgment responsible. I just did what intelligence said. So that's one thing. The second problem, which is, I think, even more intractable, is that it is impossible to give a good intelligence answer to a stupid question. For example, is there an intelligence answer? What is the role of intelligence in the so-called war on terror? Two years ago, one of my students who teaches at the Defense Intelligence College asked me to come and, and speak to, to what? There were 600 people amazing number of people at this defense, mostly military, this defense intelligence college. He said, These, we are all frustrated. We want to find ways of helping in Afghanistan. Can you, you know, tell us how we can help in the war in Afghanistan? And I said, no. 
I can put your mind at ease and tell you that, that there's nothing that you can do to help a non-policy. There is no information that will turn the key, that will give you the key to turning Afghanistan into something that it isn't. You know, you, you just, uh, there are all sorts of things that could be done to crush America's enemies. There, there are all sorts of policy decisions that could be made, but intelligence has nothing to do with them. Let me close by, by uh, pointing out uh, concerning Afghanistan one thing concerning counterintelligence, and that, that will also illuminate the problems in Afghanistan. You all have heard, I'm sure, that on December 30th, 2009, uh, a, um, a man who had been supplying information to CIA walked into a meeting of CIA folks, blew himself up, and killed, I think, or seven or eight of them. This was played up as a very, very big tragedy. Let me tell you something very cruel. That this man could have done far more harm to the United States by not killing these people at all, by continuing to supply them with information as he had supplied them for the previous 18 months. Because this man had been supplying information which was used to target these marvelously efficient drones that kill people from a distance, very efficiently, very effectively. But on the basis of what knowledge? On the basis of such information as is brought by people like that, who, whose credibility is not vetted. Ah, yes, he said something that turned out to be true. Yes, there were, there were supposed to be six people there, six houses, and at 3 o'clock, people go from A to B. Ah, he must be correct. So therefore... Put, it, put, uh, put those people on the target list. Now, that man, as I say, had been supplying information for 18 months. God knows how many innocent people that man put in the crosshairs of American drones. And those folks who got killed, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very sorry that they got killed, but by golly, they bear some responsibility for all the people that they got killed by their incompetence. Uh, and to run a, an intelligence service in ignorance of its, of its problems is, I think, very, very wrong and highly incompetent. So, uh, questions from you all. 